Hi there, welcome to the show. I'm your host, John Iverson. This week I'm joined by Isaiah Robinson, who is an elected councillor at the Kitsu Hey Hayes First Nation in Klemtu, British Columbia, the remote community about 500 kilometres north of Vancouver, and he's also the head of its uh, Economic Development Corporation. So, Isaiah, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So you and I talked earlier this week. It was uh, the, the subject of a National Post front page article on Thursday, um, and that was about the fate of the open net salmon farming industry in your community uh, and elsewhere in British Columbia, which uh, I gather has been a game changer for communities like yours. Can you tell us a bit about the history of the community and how its economic prospects have been improved in recent years by farming Atlantic salmon? Yeah, so you know, the, the real the beginning of this is, is when we faced the collapse of, of the commercial industry in 1969. And so, you know, that that really was the lead into leadership trying to say, figure out, like, we have nothing now. Because, uh, of course, we're, we're a very remote community, like you said, and, and a lot of our members were commercial fishermen. So, you know, that really brought uncertainty and so that uncertainty really led on for probably 15 to 20 years until um, you know our leadership came together saying this is enough um, we need a breadwinner for every household and how do we do that and so they pondered it some ideas were thrown around they came to the conclusion to start doing their own uh, uh, fish farming not the one we have today and so we did pilot that for a couple of years and it just wasn't um, what it, what it was, what we have today. And so it, it didn't follow through or didn't, wasn't able to make what we have. And so we, we thought, what can we do to, to make this bigger? And so my colleagues decided, let's work with industry. And so 25 years later in Clem 2, we've had a, a partnership that has just been phenomenal. And uh, you know, has, has brought our, our 5% uh, employment rate that we had in the 60s to now a 99% on the coast of British Columbia. So it's very uh, abnormal to have such a high percentage rate. But that is just due to you know just the the passion and the, the willingness and you know the the want and need to have jobs on the coast of BC. So you know it's it's just been phenomenal to see the the, the change in development on on that. End. And, and you mentioned there were clear social consequences to the collapse of the commercial fishery, and then the reinvigoration of the community with uh, fish farming. Yeah, no, that's that's really, it's it's yeah, it's we we dealt with tons of social issues, and um, you know, uh, up until today, you know, within the last twenty five years, within the last eighteen, we haven't had any suicides, and that was really the largest issue we had during the time of no commercial fishing and no jobs. Period. We it was just we had tons of problems on that, and yes, right. So the problem now is that the federal government is intent on transitioning, in inverted commas, uh, from an open net pen industry over concerns that the, the salmon farms are contributing to the demise of the wild sockeye as parasitic sea lice from the farm salmon infect the wild fish in the view of some people. Uh, is it clear what they want to transition to? Your guess is as good as mine, like, it, and that's really the the problem when it's come to this. It's we're throwing stuff into a black box, if anything, um, and, and nothing's being. We're not we, we're not really part of the process, unfortunately, and that's something. Originally, when this was all being developed, you know, two years ago, there was an option for us to be at the table to have discussions about how can we do this, but uh, unfortunately, the minister failed to to utilize that option of that. Uh, that committee that was there, unfortunately. So we have some sense of what the transition process looks like because in February, the fisheries minister, Joyce Murray, refused to reissue licenses for 15 salmon farms in the Discovery Islands, which is just, as I understand it, at the mouth of the, the Fraser River where a lot of the fish uh, swim upstream to spawn. Most people see this as the government's game plan for the other 60 or so salmon farms in the in the uh, province, including yours, is that that is obviously the fear, right? Well, that's that's really it. Is it we we just don't know how this how we're going to be handled because, you know, the the way that there's two nations that were part of that process that weren't consulted, and so how can we move forward knowing that there's these other nations that are consulting with the government, and what are they going to do with this information? Are they just going to completely disregard it? You know, the the work that we're doing 
We're doing the we're doing the legwork for the government to provide an understanding of what the transition plan is. We're consulting with their communities regarding these this 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 discussion this 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 item. So it's quite um, it's unfortunate that that's the way that they're handling this overall situation. So so this is the bit that I don't get. The government's own scientists say there is minimal risk of serious harm to the health of migrating Fraser River sockeye salmon from the fish farms. They were referring specifically to the Discovery Island uh, fish farms, but presumably that holds true for fish farms elsewhere in the province. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans ordered nine individual risk assessments completed by the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat, which suggested that while the sockeye were being hit by climate change, fishing pressures, habitat loss and so on, pathogens from Atlantic salmon were not a major factor. Do you agree with that con conclusion? Yeah, I just, for, for me, it just, the, 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 the statement that DFO scientists are stating, it all aligns with our current situation. And, and for us, you know, we've been doing our own science for, uh, for over 20 years, uh, you know, sea lice, uh, sea lice, uh, containments, uh, wild salmon, you know, we've done the whole thing, the overall interaction in our work is in the agreement with DFOs, uh, is with their science in the end. So it doesn't appear that there's really any effect of the wild salmon. In fact, when you look at the wild salmon returns near the farms, you know, up and down the coast 80 kilometers, the returns are moving up and down similar at similar rates and, and at much larger environmental problems. Uh, obviously, that, that there's there's issues like climate change. is, is probably the, the largest issue that's causing the current uh, issue with the wild stock. So the minister clearly doesn't agree with that conclusion because she closed down the Discovery Island salmon farms. Presumably she is listening to the advice of people like the Watershed Watch Salmon Society uh, who argue that there's a large body of peer-reviewed research that's found statistical relationship between parasitic lice and farms and wild salmon. They say there's a pro-farming salmon industry bias at the de Department of Fisheries and accuse the department of being blind to outside science. What would you say to that? Is that your experience? Well, DFO is an interesting situation overall, of course, but you know, when it's come down to the science, like I said, we've done our own science and our science is parallel with DFOs. It, it all adds up and it all, it's very, very similar. So for these environmentalists to even discredit us who have been doing our own science over the last 20 years, let alone the protection we've done in our territories and all these other stuff like it, it, those stuff the amount of stuff we've done just to ensure that there's the science is 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 there it's it's unfortunate that that's the way they like to handle it i mean the the the, the inference there is that the the dfo is a puppet to industry but clearly you're not a puppet to industry and you no. have no desire to see the wild salmon stocks depleted um so it it uh, it does seem to be uh, somewhat excessive to suggest that nobody cares about the wild salmon stocks, and that's and that's really the unfortunate part is that's what these um, activists are stating, and I'm just like, it, your statement doesn't make sense. We 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 fish all the same salmon you're seeing, and the science, uh, or, and what we see is just it's. The, the, the depletion of, has happened over the last 30 years. You talk to any commercial fisherman, they'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. And salmon farming has only been in BC for, you know, nearly 25 to, you know, just just at the, the beginning of maybe 30 years ago. So it's just doesn't, it doesn't add up. So the government has a, a clear duty to consult First Nations like yours that would be so adversely impacted by any decision not to reissue licenses. Minister Murray was due to take her proposal on transition to Cabinet this month. On Tuesday, it was said to me, I'm not sure whether it's been publicly announced yet, but I'm, I was told that she will extend the consultation process by six months, presumably, presumably to allow a more uh, detailed socio-economic analysis of what the impacts would be on communities like yours. Do you, do you think that will make any difference, or do you think she's already made up her own mind? Well... I think the minister, I've interacted with her many a times in the last two years since we've we've had this situation and um, knowing her and, and the, those discussions, uh, her decision has already been made in my perspective. All right. It does sound like there is some pushback around the cabinet table, though, that there are some more judicious ministers who might not agree with her. Yeah, and, and that's the, 
the biggest part because there's economics. There's so many other layers to this decision. Uh, and when it comes down to it, this is not just going to affect my community. Uh, it's it's going to affect the whole coast of British Columbia. The amount of, and, and not just that, the Canada as a whole. Like I was just reading yesterday that StatsCan says there's a decrease of uh, fresh product in, in, in Canada in regards to fruits and stuff. You throw the salmon farms or you, you throw this Atlantic salmon, this great protein out, the, like it's just going to be, right. the, the amount of money that people are going to have to start spending for food is just unprecedented. Right, so it drives up the price of salmon. Presumably as well, the, the activists wouldn't be happy leaving it alone no. at the, the West Coast. There would be a, a knock-on effect and a drive to close salmon farms on the East Coast. Well, that's the thing, though. Like, if this, if the minister proceeds with their plan, the industry is just not going to be like, okay, uh, we're done with the West Coast. If anything, we they're going to take a big enough hit. They might just pull out, and and that would be even more detrimental. To the overall economy. It's a multi-billion-dollar economy. Let alone in BC, that it, it is the largest agricultural industry. You know, that's not ever provided to the public. That right. that. That salmon farming is such a large part of our economy. Right, your largest agricultural exports come from 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 uh, farm salmon. I mean, th right. I think the industry numbers are it generates two billion dollars in economic activity and employs eight thousand people, and there just does not seem to be a justification for closing that industry down when the science is so unclear. Yeah, and and they've already closed a couple down. Like they they've done what they've needed to do, but the, the just she, yeah, there she's on a war path and she's. She just wants to get this over with, and, and uh, yeah. Just a final point. The, the, the government was elected on a promise of balancing the environment and the economy and on Indigenous reconciliation. And it seems to me in both this particular case shows it falling short on, on both of those policies. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, and I think like in 2019 when this was thrown onto the, uh, their platform, it was probably one of the last things thrown on there. And I'm like, what is happening? This is not like, they didn't do their homework obviously because they didn't understand how many nations were working with farms at that time. Right. And so, you know, at this time they're 17. And so when it comes down to it, the it's unfortunate that they're proceeding down this path, uh, but not understanding there are the promises of reconciliation and, uh, and uh, environmental, uh, you know, science and all these other things that they're dealing with right now. It's just really, um, it's an unfortunate situation when it comes down to what they've promised and, and how they're trying to handle it. You can't pick and choose when reconciliation and, uh, can be done. It's, right. it's not a personal, like it's just, it's not how it works. Great, well listen, thank you very much for coming on. Let's hope uh, common sense prevails. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay.